Hi everybody, I'm John Rourke, Editor-in-Chief of Phoenix Home and Garden Magazine, and we're here at the Arizona Fine Art Expo. Uh, it's here through uh, the end of March, and it's the big tent you see on Scottsdale Road. So we're going to introduce you to one of the artists who is exhibiting here, Charles Huckaba. Hello, Hello John. Charles. And uh, so you work in acrylics, which are very textural, and you're, you do a lot of uh, inspiration or, or you are um, uh, using as reference prehistoric pictographs and petroglyphs, correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. Uh, that's one of the, the perks of the job is the hiking and exploring. And of course, Arizona is just uh, prolific with, with prehistoric and historic rock art. Uh, the technical term for rock art is rupestre, and today, for example, at NAU, you can get a degree in rock art study, master's or PhD, which is only 20 years old. At one time, this was an offshoot. It was the kind of the hocus pocus of archaeology as to, well, we don't know what they mean. We know what a piece of pottery means. We know what an arrowhead means, a piece of, of old fabric or whatever, but we don't know what these are because they're so embedded in the, the spirit and the personality of, of artists that could be 15,000 years old. So archaeology ignored it pretty much and said, well, it's significant, it's an artifact, but we don't know what they mean, so ignore it. Interesting. That's changed really? today. Really? Okay. Yeah, so I moved into the Kosos region in uh, Eastern California. Uh, I went to high school there. And it is a world-class rock art site and visited by people from all over the world now. And that's where I grew up. And being an artist and art inclined, but never thinking it in terms of it being my, my full career, uh, until I maybe the later part of, of being at the University of California, where I was able to say, well, I don't need to change the images. I like them as artifacts the way they are. I can do them in paint, I can present them in detail or in total, uh, but I don't need to change the story. Uh, I just leave that the way it is, and but yet make it my art, contemporary, ancient meets modern, by doing them in color, doing them in acrylic, and building up textures in ways that, yes, they're on the rock, they're on the lava, sandstone, or granite, but uh, I, I'm going to do that in acrylic paint rather than trying to be a uh, rendering in a, in a representational manner. Like exactly. I've got to make it look like rock. Right, right, right. You know, so I can build up the texture because they're all etched and chipped out, which means they're always going to be rough and have a chipped at okay. look. Some are smoother than others. When you work on lava, like some of the stuff around here, uh, it, it can be pretty rough because you're working on a topography. If you can imagine, you know, working from above on the earth with all of the different topography right. and trying to chip out and make artwork out of a three-dimensional surface. So we're doing it with paint is, is, is different. Because people have suggested before, well, why don't you do this on granite or lava or sandstone? And it's like the logistics of doing it, <laughs> it's, and when you do it this way, I think it comes off better as fine art than if I was taking a slab of stone and trying to replicate Right. process. And how do you hang a slab of stone yeah. on a wall? I mean, you also, could, but... Sure. Yeah. Okay, so a piece like this, which is enormous, what is that? Like a Three eight feet, feet tall by ten feet wide. Wow, okay. On and, gallery and wrap. Okay, do I understand that uh, this is a, a commission yes. for a client? Okay, so what we're seeing here, is this the way that it existed no, when it's in it, one or canyon. you take those elements and you create a composition? Well, I always heard from digital photographs, so the, the, these are referred to as elements. Okay. Those are all accurate, okay. the individual elements. But this panel right here is called the family panel. This is the owl panel. Now, it in, in reality, is about the size of that. And then that panel over on the right is called the hunting panel or the cottonwood panel. Now, in Nine Mile Canyon, maybe 10, 15 miles spread apart are these three. Okay. I put them together, but, the, okay. but in reality, that one right over there is on the boulder by itself. This one is on a boulder by itself, and this is on a cliff wall by itself. So I've combined the three of the most popular uh, and scenic of, of rock art panels uh, into one canvas. Okay. And the client who has a Rubicon Jeep and loves to go exploring <laughs> has been to some of these sites in Utah and loves Utah rock art. So we, he had the space and he is a collector of mine. 
His wife collects my chroma textures. Okay. And he's in his man cave, his office, he collects the petroglyphs. And he said, I have a space high up and I need some uh, art. And the light went on. I've got a three foot I've by ten foot canvas. <laughs> and I, I know exactly what we can do. And it all fell together really well. But really, his he's the... Uh, uh, the person that really kind of brought it out of me as to what to do for him. Because Utah is, is I, I consider to be the capital of rock art. So to narrow it down to say, well, what is it that you want for your two-story wall up there it would have been difficult. But I, immediately I thought of these three panels putting together. And they never been put together like that. So it's uh, probably easily 10,000 years of of time in, in the, these panels, they're all prehistoric. Uh, and of course, historic is when there's any evidence of European contact in okay. the art. Okay, oh, interesting, okay. Yeah. So, and how long does it take for you to do a piece of this size? This piece took months. Uh, I think, I've been working on it for about a year. Okay. So it's on and off. I've been working on other things. I didn't work continuously on just this one, but there were times the last couple of months where I worked on it exclusively just to get it done before we came back to the Arizona Fine Art Expo. Okay, and will you be working on a piece here during the expo? Oh yeah, always. I'll okay. be working on that piece behind him there. Matt there is uh, uh, going to be one of my chroma textures. Okay, and that's and, what I want to talk uh, about next. I've got uh, the cardinal on the other side is, yes. is also in progress. And do I understand correctly that you are the creator of this technique? I think pretty much. I mean, I'm, you, I'm sorry, you call it what? Chroma, hashtag chroma textures. Chroma all textures. one word, lowercase. Okay, and so the the um, the the technique looks a lot more like, especially this uh, piece behind us here, a lot more detailed, but it kind of in a different way. I mean, these are all hyper detailed, but um, describe the difference between that style and this. Well, style. Th that is all wet paint put onto the surface. Okay, it's a, a wet paint stages, whereas this is dry paint from a different number of sources that I get the paint and how I prepare it, and then I put it into wet paint. So it's dry paint into wet paint, and the wet paint is the bond or, or the, quote, glue, end quote, so to okay. speak. Okay, so like you would make the little circular a form. puddle, okay, and put the pieces in. I can only work generally about an inch at a time. And the pieces that you're placing into the puddle, how do you do those? I cut them, I use an X-Acto knife sometimes. But it's all uh, paint? Yeah, it's paper. all acrylic okay. paint. It's no. all acrylic, okay. Yeah. Attention and, all right. artists. and that keeps it uh, at being an acrylic painting as opposed to assemblage or collage or where you can mix media and materials, but I, I've always worked with acrylic. So I, so I, I figured out I, it has to be exclusively acrylic paint. Okay. So, so yeah, I, th I think it, it is sort of my brainchild, but certainly paint and texture is not, there's a lot of people in the show that do texture and sure. paint, but I think that the way that I'm doing it is, is fairly unique. Um, but I, I, I've been, I love innovation, and it's not like I seek innovation just for its own sake, but I think by being open with this technique is that I'm not confined to paint the way other people paint. So new ideas come out sometimes just for experimentation to where it's like, well, what if I did it that way? And it, it works out really well. So my, all my clients are very pleased and, and I think I have a large number of collectors that like this texture. Mm -hmm. And I think every year that I've been in the show, I've been in this valley 26 years. Okay. Eight years at Celebration and 18 here. That's amazing. And I have seen trends in art, you know, going more abstract, contemporary, or some people that uh, have working much more representationally and historically with Western or Indian Native American. And I, I think that uh, I've seen a lot of transitions, but one of the main ones I've seen is more and more texture more pigment on the canvas. Interesting, okay. You know, uh, and speaking of abstract, so most of, most of your pieces that I'm seeing are nature-based, but like this one here, what, what, how, what's the, what, what happened here? <laughs> well, I came out of the university a long time ago, long before you were born, uh, at University of California as really, I had to learn realism. I had okay. to learn all the, uh, the realistic techniques. Uh, in oil painting, watercolor, gouache, but I always loved during that time period of the early 70s abstract art. 
Okay. Now, abstract art is is uncharted, open territory. Sure. Sometimes it's too much freedom for most people. Right. They they need okay. There's a flower. I want that flower, and I can mimic it and do it. But anything outside of that, scary. Mm -hmm. You know. So abstract art for me is is like jazz. It, it, it's exactly. you. It's improv. It's experimental. It's learning your media, but it's, uh, it's always skirting the uh, outskirts of representation to sort of like, well, what can I make with color and texture and action? But yet, people, each person that looks at it can go, here's what I see. Exactly. You know, rather than defining it for them and saying, oh, it's a horse. It's a guy on a horse. Right. Okay. Well done. Beautiful. But so abstraction has always appealed to me. I think that's why the, the rock art appeals to me because it is pretty abstract in terms of, well, that looks like a deer, but, or is it an elk? Right. Or is it an antelope? You know, right. things like that. Okay. So I, I think I've always been drawn to the more abstract. But in this valley, for me, I, I just couldn't see where I could uh, have reached this level purely on abstract painting. Okay. Oh, interesting. There's was well, a much point. broader base of people that come through this show and the other one and any of the shows around here, maybe even the museums and galleries, that there's far more people that want representational mm -hmm. as opposed to things verging into more and more abstract. Okay. You know, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a jackrabbit. It's obvious. But in many other ways, when you zoom in or whatever, I mean, it becomes completely abstract. Exactly. So it's I have to keep the rabbit because I like rabbits, and there are more people that like rabbits. And I said, well, I'm going to do just that and call it a jackrabbit. Right. And somebody walks up and says, "This looks like a jackrabbit to me. Do you have any jackrabbits?" Right. You know. So uh, I think abstract art and these techniques of, of spilling, dripping, throwing it, cutting it. Uh, uh, working it this way has spilled over into other innovations, but uh, I think by this age uh, it's safer to, for me to stick to things that I'm familiar with than to go off in a direction that would be nothing but this work in my booth. Sure. Right. Okay. Yeah. And there have been some shows, I've been here 18 years in this one, where I've had all abstract work and I sold it, but it, it, it didn't go out the door like the animals. Okay. Or about half of my sales are, are rock art and the other half are the chroma textures. Okay. Oh, but, uh, okay. And then I wanted to zoom in, if we could, real quick, just on this cardinal, which is so, um, it almost looks like leather. Well, it, it's acrylic, dry acrylic paint. You can control the viscosity and the thickness. I mean, if I if I poured a sheet that deep, right. it would take months to dry. Right. But then to cut it, you know, that's the other thing is, is how to cut it. So there's a there's a, a a balance of thickness and the viscosity of the paint and the animal, which animal it is. I mean, if if I had a, a somebody come in a couple of years ago and said, I have a pet horse, a stallion or something like that. Can you do the stallion this way? And I said, No, I can't. You know, it's it's a shiny, silky-looking animal. How am I going to make shiny silk out of? It? If I did do it, it's going to end up costing you two hundred thousand dollars right. to cut up all that paint to make it sm smooth and silky. Sure. So it was like, no, I can't. I can't do your horse. But there's other animals that lend themselves, again, partly in abstraction, to uh, desert tortoises, javelinas. Uh, uh, Gila monsters, and uh, there are creatures that lend themselves perfectly to me cutting up the acrylic paint this way. So, okay, interesting. Well, Charles Huckaba is here at the Arizona Fine Art Expo uh, now through the end of March. You can come in, see him working on pieces, see a bunch of our other artists, uh, uh, more than 80 artists, uh, 120 working studios. Um, the expo is open every day from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Tickets are available at ArizonaFineArtExpo.com. We hope to see you here.